I think we can begin. The title of this session is Demystifying the Network, the Theory, Models, and Testing. So the paper in these sessions aim to improve our understanding of network algorithms. We're going to see a lot of techniques from other fields applied to actually analyze and test algorithms and heuristics. Speaker, first speaker is Anush Gagwa, the PhD student at CMU, advised by Professor Srinivasan Session. He is broadly interested in systems and networking. Specifically, he is interested in performance modeling and formal methods for systems. So, yeah, take the word. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Anu, and today I'm excited to talk about our work where we're investigating if computers can help, help us design and analyze heuristics. Uh, this is joint work with collaborators at CMU and MIT. In systems, heuristics are our bread and butter, and they're ubiquitous in a system such as congestion control, scheduling, video streaming, to name a few. Heuristics make key decisions on how a system may adapt to different conditions, and they incorporate a designer's intuition about system behavior. In general, designing heuristics is hard. Many times, we don't have a rigorous understanding of upper and lower bounds in performance or the cases where heuristics may break. To start off, we focus on our community's favorite heuristic, congestion control. We've spent decades designing novel congestion control algorithms, or CCS in short, but we still don't know how to build CCS that are performant across a variety of network conditions. Here's just a list of publications identifying scenarios where existing CCS break. And so we ask this natural question. Can computers automatically consider all the subtle system behavior and help us in designing heuristics that are provably performant? We envision a system where the user has a way to describe what the network looks like and what objectives they want. And we get as, a, an out, as output a CCA and lemmas that prove that the congestion control algorithm meets its performance objectives under the specified networks. In this way, we alleviate the human being from thinking about the corner cases where their system may break. We can use this to build tailor-made CCAs for different combinations of environments and objective pairs and retune our CCAs as assumptions about our networks change. So how can we achieve this vision? We leverage advances in mathematical modeling and program synthesis. We formulate reasoning questions as there exists for all formulas. For example, does there exist a CCA such that for all the specified network behaviors, the CCA achieves its desired objectives. And we solve such formulas using a technique from program synthesis called counterexample guided inductive synthesis, or CGIS in short. Let's see how this technique works. CGIS consists of iterative interaction between a generator and a verifier. The generator proposes a candidate congestion control algorithm from a search space. Then the verifier checks if this candidate meets the desired objectives. If not, the verifier produces what's called a counterexample network trace, where the congestion control, the candidate congestion control algorithm witnesses poor performance. Based on this information, the generator prunes its search space and proposes a new candidate. Eventually, if the verifier cannot find a counterexample, we have the solution CC. The fact that the verifier cannot find a counterexample is a certificate that there's no network behavior that can break the CCA. Alternatively, it's possible that the generator can also fail to find a new candidate. This means that our search space uh, is not sufficient to build a CCA that's, that can meet our desired objectives under the specified network. To use this framework, we need to overcome several technical challenges. First, we need to define the search space of CCAs. We also need to build a mathematical model for the network behavior so that the verifier can check whether the condition control algorithm satisfies all the desired objectives. We also need a way to specify the set objectives 
And even after we do all of this, the framework may still take a long time to solve our queries. And so uh, let's see how we can solve some of these challenges. And specifically for the second challenge, we can fortunately directly use some of the encoding proposed by prior work. So let's see how we build our uh, search spaces. In defining the search space, we face a trade-off between expressivity and tractability. Larger search spaces cover a variety of CCA choices. Uh, and so the human can, uh, it, it allows the human to reason about a large space uh, quickly, but then the computer faces a long, hard time uh, reasoning about the large search space. So there's a trade-off like for, for the human, you want the surface to be as big as possible, whereas for the computer, you want it to be as small as possible. And so to uh, address this trade-off in our prototype, we use templates to specify search spaces. Templates describe how a congestion controls algorithms, congestion window, or sending rate may evolve as a function of observable signals, such as acknowledgments, losses, or delays. The template has holes which are desired or synthesized by the generator. And users can iterate over templates and also guide synthesis by encoding signals that they think might be more valuable. Our templates capture the signals and actions that existing CCS consider. However, they differ in two key ways. First, uh, typical CCS will respond to every acknowledgement. Instead of doing that, our templated CCS, they respond on every RTD. Prior work has shown that such CCS are competitive with existing CCS. Second, typical CCS may store state to make future decisions in condition control. Instead of this, we give direct access to a small window of historical signals to the congestion control algorithm. Both these features vastly simplify the complexities of our mathematical models, keeping our search space tractable. Moving on to objectives, typically in congestion control, we'll care about the performance of a CCA when it has potentially converged to steady state. However, in the CGS loop, our verifier only sees finite snapshots of time. In these time windows, objectives can be violated transiently. For instance, at flow initialization, it may take the CCA some time to learn the, its fair share of the network bandwidth. And so the verifier really needs a way to check properties about infinite execution using only finite snapshots. And to get around this, we redefine our objectives as invariants that are necessary for the CCA to first achieve convergence and then meet the, its objectives when it has converged. And then we use these invariants and mathematical induction to prove properties about infinite execution. Unfortunately, all this is not enough. Out of the box, the CGIS loop <laughs> is slow and it fails to find solutions in weeks. And we have to develop several optimizations to solve our queries in minutes. <laughs> I'll briefly describe the intuition behind one of our optimizations. Consider the search space of CCAs. Uh, the generator picks a point in this search space in each iteration of the CGIS loop. Now, there may be many counterexamples that break the CCA. Here, the oval corresponding to a counterexample uh, represents the space of CCA CCAs pruned by that counterexample or broken by that counterexample. Since different counterexamples encode different amount of information, they prune different amount of our search space. We identify what properties of counterexamples govern the size of the search space prune and pick larger counterexamples, speeding up our search. Our preliminary evaluations with our prototype tool have yielded pro promising results. So we asked our prototype to synthesize CCAs that achieve high utilization and low delay on networks with deep amount of buffering and jitter that can be as large as the propagation delay. These are settings where prior work has shown that such large jitter can fool existing CCAs to achieve close to zero utilization and typical loss based CCAs under this setting keep bloating buffers. For this query, our prototype reproduced a known algorithm called DROC and its unknown variants that achieve different throughput and delay trade-offs. 
in summary, in systems, we're at a time where we have good mathematical tools to model our heuristics and also the environments that they operate in. We can use these tools to perform automated reasoning, allowing us to ease the design and analysis of heuristics. Looking forward, we are experimenting with different settings such as arbitrary buffer sizes and also designing CCAs that have better average case performance in, uh, in addition to just good worst case performance. And we're also looking at more challenging objectives such as fairness or flow completion time. And also in my talk, I mostly talked about synthesizing CCAs given some assumptions about the environments and objectives. We're also exploring if we can reverse this. So given a CCA, can we synthesize any implicit assumptions that the CCA makes? We believe such queries will help us better understand when existing heuristics work or break. Also, while I mostly talked about congestion control, our broader vision is domain agnostic. We believe that our approach can be applied to several domains such as video streaming and scheduling. We believe tools such as network calculus and queuing theory will help us model environments in these domains. So with our work, we are hoping that we can improve the standard of performance guarantees for heuristics and systems. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you for the talk. Uh, Alexander Dietmuller from ETH Zurich. Um, I want to say arguably one of the biggest challenges for congestion of all video stream protocols are the interaction of different clients. Do you have any suggestions how one could even start to model like an unknown number of clients with different demands and how they would interact and what impact that could have on a synthesized protocol? Uh, that, that's a good question. So we are actually so explicitly right now we've only modeled like interaction of a single flow, but like the way we model jitter, it can also be used to emulate what, like jitter can also be an artifact of other flows. So one way is that we extend the mo what the link does so that it can represent interaction from other flows, or we can model explicitly interaction from other flows directly. But yeah, that increases the size of our like modeling and slows down our uh, approach. So we're also investigating other optimizations that can speed up our search but yes it's it is a challenging problem and uh i, I feel there are some ways around them but yeah like it's not a clean solution yet thank you sure. hi this is uh we from rice um i have a question regarding the snapshot so i think an algorithm can be cracked within each snapshot but if you observe the dynamic of the signals in reality, you may have some comments. Like if you are using a delay based signal, delay based algorithm, the delay may fluctuate up and down. And uh, with that, your converge just throughput may be lower than your expectation. So this kind of dynamic will make a difference. And uh, is there any solution to it? Yeah, so the whole point of the invariants is that they capture like. So when we build the invariants, if a CCA satisfies those invariants, uh, we know that like, irrespective of how the link rate or uh, non-congestive delay evolves, the congestion control algorithm will converge to uh, like meet its desired objectives in steady state. So it's by construction that like, of all the evolutions of like link rate and delay uh, considered like the CCA will work. I see that some CCs that will not converge, they will fluctuate around the coverage point. <coughs> yeah, so basically, okay, the good way to think about this is you can think of uh, a steady state of like congestion window values and let's say the queue sizes. So the invariant looks something like this. If the initial congestion window or of the snapshot or the queue sizes lie within that steady state region, then after the snapshot, they'll still be within that steady state region. And if they're outside the steady state region, then they'll converge towards the steady state region. So basically, uh, we end up saying that, okay, if you're not having good performance yet, you'll move towards the steady state region. And we prove that in the steady state region, you always get good performance. And within that steady state region, it can be large enough that the CCA can oscillate its transition window or the queue utilization. Thank you.
I see. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And last one, Microsoft. So, a uh, quick question. So, how easily is this extensible to heuristics where there the behavior is topology dependent? If you want to model the topology as well, would that complicate the issue further? And how would you handle that? That's a good question. I've not explicitly thought about it. Uh, yeah. So basically, like the environment needs to be modeled within, like, so right now we're modeling it within SMT. I'm not sure if there's a way to like specify unknown like or parameterized version of topology. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I'd have to think if there is an encoding, there might be. So basically, it would look something like okay, if I'm like a, a network composed of routers and uh, 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 endos or whatever, and like I specify like say the the degree of the each router is chosen by the verifier or like uh and that sort of affects how the workload and heuristics interact if we have a way to represent these things in math then we can do that but it'll be somewhat problem specific like okay what is the problem we're trying to solve which takes as input this topology so the mathematical modeling might be specific to that but yeah i i can't say whether it's possible or not, we'll, we'll have to look at the specific instance that we're trying to solve. Hi, uh, Matthew from Stanford. Um, I was curious because like you were talking about speeding things up, but it sounds like you're doing this kind of offline ahead of time. Um, do you see doing it online in the future? Or am I wrong about that, first of all? And second of all, do you see, if I'm not wrong about that, do you see doing it online in the future? And do you think you can get it to the sort of like speed where you could be doing this kind of in real time, like with this, you know, data, this sort of network pattern, we get this kind of, we can reconfigure our configuration and so forth. Okay, so I, I'd like to clarify, like uh, the heuristics that we're building are offline and they're, they're not learning anything. So it's, mm -hmm. we have the heuristic, so we have a template. Once we get a satisfying assignment for the holes, it's a concrete heuristic that you can implement in next kernel. So condition control you can implement. And it's not learning anymore. It has decided all its parameters. And uh, in that sense, it's offline. And so the pruning step that I talked about, it's basically what it's doing. It's, it's speeding up the CGIS group. I see. So it's, it's, but is one hour versus one minute that important to you if you're doing it all offline? So, okay, it's not one hour versus one minute. Uh, like if we don't use our optimization, we've seen it sometimes even runs for months and we don't even know if it's correct or will it ever give a result. So we had to build these optimizations so that like at the end of the day, a human is looking at the produced heuristic and we want it to have some level of interactivity. But yes, like if you're building a new machine to algorithm, like we're fine if the computer takes a week or so, but it still needs, we, we still need some notion of, okay, this much is the time that we have to wait for to get a result. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, I think we'll just take one more question. Uh, maybe the other questions can be done offline. Okay. Uh, hi, Greg Grab for you. So yeah, this is really interesting work. Uh, and I, I see, you know, why you pointed out it's more difficult to use this kind of an approach on uh, kind of infinite properties, long-term steady state behavior. But actually, I think um, on balance, probably not enough attention is given in a lot of congestion control work to short-term behavior startup behavior when an application has to send like a, a burst of traffic at some moment. The, those transient be behaviors maybe are important and interesting. Maybe this is an area when where your approaches could be pretty effective. So I wonder if you looked at uh, short-term transient properties in the design process. So could you give an example of a transient property? Like uh, well, like for example, performance during startup of the flow uh, or if some, uh, if, if there's a pause and then a restart in application demand, that would be another example among, okay. among others, like sudden changes in network conditions. That kind of thing. Okay, so concretely right now what we're doing is, so at the boundaries of the snapshots, the link rate can vary arbitrarily. So, and what we say is that the CCA at the beginning of the snapshot, if it's not doing well, it should try to do better by the end of the snapshot. And right now we're not imposing any restrictions on how quickly it moves towards a good state. So I think like 
if you want a CCA that has good properties during transient behavior, so let's just during slow start, like you'll also have to put some constraints on how quickly it converges. So right now we're just asking it to converge eventually, but we can also put restrictions on quickly to get more better performance during these transient phases. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Dave Deep, and uh, I recently finished my PhD uh, from CMU, uh, Advice by Station. Today, I'll be presenting um, work that's in the same theme as the previous one, which is kind of related to automated tools for testing or designing congestion control algorithms. So, um, so we use a genetic algorithm-based fuzzing for testing uh, kind of uh, existing congestion control algorithms to find uh, uh, kind of issues with them. So I'll get started with my talk. So today there's a need for uh, designing a lot of novel CCAs um, and there's a lot of challenges in doing this. So today there are emerging applications that have very unique requirements. So you can look at uh, cloud gaming or uh, machine learning workloads that have very unique traffic patterns. Um, and so there's a need to design these new CCAs. And testing these new complex CCAs are challenging. Um, there may be algorithmic deficiencies which overlook certain kind of network conditions, uh, or there may be implementation bugs uh, that cause it uh, to get low throughput or high delays. Um, and this is especially challenging in an academic setting where uh, people who are doing research on CCAs have limited opportunities for uh, large scale deployment and testing under kind of real world scenarios. So, um, there are many existing techniques to test congestion control algorithms. So there's like code-based fuzzing that can detect uh, more kind of lower level bugs. Um, but the downside is that they don't detect like network scenarios which cause that code path to get triggered, for example. And then there's scenario-based techniques like packet drill, um, which uh, you specify manual scenarios um, and it can run an automated suite of tests. So it's good for regression testing and iterative improvement. Um, uh, but you can miss out critical cases and manually generating these scenarios is pretty tedious. So the goal is to generate an automated tool um, that causes, uh, that, that can find network behavior that causes low performance in a CCA. So I'm gonna talk about the design uh, of our system. So CCFuzz essentially uses genetic algorithm to generate network traces um, to kind of trigger bad behavior in a CCA. So we start with a pool of network traces, um, and then we simulate the CCA that we're testing in NS3. Uh, so we'll have like a pool of, let's say 500 traces. We simulate how it performs on these traces, and then we have a scoring function that's based on the property that we're trying to test. So let's say we wanna test uh, whether it's getting good utilization. So we can define a scoring function that says, if it gets high utilization, it receives a low score. If it gets low utilization, it receives a high score, which means those are relevant for us. So now uh, the traces that let's say get high utilization, we discard them because these are not interesting to us. And the traces that get low utilization, we uh, perform some mutations and crossovers between these traces to generate an updated pool of traces. So uh, the traces that perform poorly, uh, you, you take those and then you kind of mix and match them, generate some more traces, and you kind of keep iterating uh, on this uh, until you find traces that are interesting. So our network model, uh, so we actually have two different network models. So in one model, we uh, have a variable uh, rate link with a fixed Q size. And uh, essentially what it, uh, we have a heuristic that generates like realistic network traces. Uh, uh, the details are in the paper, but I'll discuss this a little bit more later on. And the second model we do is um, a fixed rate bottleneck link with a fixed buffer size and an adversarial uh, cross traffic sender that can generate arbitrary bursts. So there's no realism constraints here because the cross traffic can be arbitrary. So uh, these are uh, slightly different and there's more details in the paper on how we uh, deal with these two cases. So our trace generation heuristics, essentially what they do is they limit the long-term variability in the rate. So let's say uh, so on, uh, in 
Uh, oh, my cursor is not visible. Okay, yeah. So uh, over here, we are looking at a five second time scale, and there's a limited rate variation over five seconds. So this is like the service curve. Uh, packets transmitted is on the y axis, and time is on the x axis. And on a short time scale, we actually allow arbitrary uh, jitter, essentially. So uh, that's what our heuristic is. Um, so we actually got some interesting results running this simple kind of iterative loop. So first, we found a bug in BBR in NS3. Uh, so what happens is if there's an RTO, it can misinterpret uh, acts for older transmissions as acts for spurious retransmissions, and that causes BBR to get stuck at a very low throughput, and it never recovers from that. And we were able to trigger this using a, a, a link trace and a cross track trace. So on the left, we have a link trace where, uh, or sorry, we have a cross traffic trace where there's a burst of cross traffic here, which causes some losses. And it causes a second loss after some time, and that triggers an RTO, which causes a BBR to get stuck after one second. And on the right, we have a link trace uh, where we see a similar result where BBR gets stuck at a low throughput. Um, so how would someone use this tool? So we uh, implemented a simple patch for BBR, which was uh, trigger uh, essentially a min RTT probe when an RTO occurs. And uh, that allows BBR to slow down so that these spurious retransmissions don't happen. And with that, we see that uh, without the fix, uh, CCFuzz is able to trigger the bug in about 20 generations. And with the fix, uh, it's not able to trigger the bug. Uh, so that shows that uh, uh, that kind of fixes the problem a little bit. Um, so we have some other findings. So we found a bug in NS3's TCP cubic window update. Um, and we could also automatically synthesize the TCP low rate attack, where it essentially sends bursts uh, to prevent TCP from ever growing its window. Um, and uh, we also generated traces uh, where we had a different goal to see whether BBR uh, just operates at very high delays. And it was able to generate link traces, which prevent BBR from seeing min RTD, and so it always operates at a very high delay. Um, so now I'll uh, go over some discussion points. So right now we use a heuristic uh, to generate realistic traces, but we have some future ideas where essentially we uh, generate a completely like random trace, like there's no limitations on the realism of the trace, but what we do is we run the trace on a big set of existing CCAs and see whether there are some CCAs that perform well on it. If there are no CCAs that perform well on it, that means it's not interesting to us. Whereas if there's at least one or two CCS that perform reasonably well, then it's interesting. So using this method, uh, like the graph on the left shows some service curves that are interesting. And the graph on the right shows a bunch of service curves that are uninteresting. So for example, if you had like zero throughput for like four and a half seconds, and then you have like a very large uh, uh, transmission opportunity available towards the end, that's not really a useful trace. Um, and uh, yeah, so we plan to implement this for uh, and replacing our heuristic. Um, and then some other future directions. So link fuzzing and trace fuzzing do not cover every possible network scenario. So we could combine them together, which increases the complexity, but it's doable. Um, we could also kind of do random loss traces uh, apart from the link based and cross traffic based traces. Um, also, one problem we faced was many traces generated by CCFuzz look quite similar. And so we plan to use some kind of classification technique to promote diversity in the set of traces that's produced in a single run. Uh, so right now, like you would have to run it once, fix the bug, and run it again to trigger a different bug. Um, so we want to avoid that and generate like a diverse set of traces that trigger different kinds of bugs. Uh, the third is right now the user needs to come up with kind of uh, intelligent scoring functions. For example, if you wanted low throughput, you can't just take the average because that biases uh, it towards finding traces that trigger low throughput early on. Uh, so what we do is we kind of take windowed throughput and take a percentile so that it doesn't bias the algorithm search uh, heuristic to go towards like traces where it triggers a bug in the first second and then it's like zero throughput throughout uh, the trace. Um, so yeah, so in the future, um, we plan to kind of maybe implement something where you can logically specify what kind of goals you want and it automatically generates uh, these scoring functions. So yeah, that concludes my talk and I'm happy to do any questions.
Uh, so great talk, thank you, thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering, are you after implementation bugs or semantic bugs? Like, do you care whether the specification of the protocol is the same as the implementation? Like, could you? So um, over here, we are testing an implementation in some sense, like uh, we are testing NS3's implementation here, right? So um, it's gonna find bugs that are due to a bad in implementation, it's also going to find bugs that are due to a bad protocol design. So it's going to combine the two. Um, so for example, the RTO bug is actually uh, because of um, the way BBR tracks its min RTT uh, or BBR tracks its uh, probing cycle for bandwidth. Uh, it uses like uh, the act bytes um, and uses that to track like one RTT essentially. And so because of these spurious acts, the timing gets messed up. Um, and so if you actually use the timer to do like one RTT, it would not trigger this bug. So uh, yeah, it kind of does a holistic uh, evaluation. Okay, let's see in the rest of Oslo. Um, you are testing always only one flow? Uh, so we have two models that we're testing. So in one model, we are varying the links. So in this case, um, when you have like a loss, right? Uh, that means it's because of a buffer overflow. Uh, but the delay during that time can be arbitrary because your link could be very slow. And so your buffer is draining very slowly. If we have a second model where we are uh, doing a cross traffic injection into the bottleneck. So over here in this model, the losses always occur at like a fixed delay. Okay, but the flow yeah. under test is only one flow. The flow under test is only one flow. Yes, yeah, so yeah. it could also have an impact. On yeah, they're not looking at interactions. Yeah. So this is similar to like uh, the previous talk, right? Where they're essentially modeling arbitrary link jitter uh, with the assumption that the effects of some cross traffic would be covered in this model. Uh, right in the end, like cross traffic is basically going to cause jitter and loss. Um, so if we kind of model that, the hope is it covers it. But yeah, right now we're just doing one. So we could potentially do multiple. Okay, great idea, by the way. Great, great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I had a question, right? Because uh, in programs, I kind of know what fuzzing misses. It misses these sort of long paths with lots of branches where you have to kind of pick the lock by solving all these right. path constraints. Can you give me like a one sentence sort of description? Because like these congestion control algorithms are kind of more continuous sort of things. Like the code doesn't have a bunch of path constraints. Like, is there, do you have a good sense of what kind of bugs is fuzzing missing here? Um, so, so in this case, at least we found some bugs where the events happen over like a duration of one and a half seconds. So the BBR bug is triggered when you have a loss and then it does fast retransmit and you have another loss of the retransmitted packet and then it triggers an RTO and then one second later it like stops functioning. So, um, uh, but because we are, so in the end, like this is gonna search the whole space of traces, right? So if you keep running it long enough, hopefully it will trigger something. But right now we are doing like a five second evaluation. So if there are things that are longer than that, this won't catch it. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess. But is there some description of like what you might, what sorts of classes of bugs you might have to run longer to find, or is it just um, if you have like things that have very long term like uh, state, right? So for example, BBR has a ten second min RTT. I see. So, so it's not about how so, long you're running the algorithm; it's how long are you tracing? Yeah. How long is your trace? And the longer your trace is. Um, your search space becomes exponentially larger. So it might take many, many more iterations to converge and each iteration takes longer, right? Because you have to simulate now a longer scenario. Um, and uh, so simulation also has its downsides, right? You're not testing like a real implementation. So you could potentially use emulation for this, but that will take even longer because right now uh, it can simulate like 500 traces or five seconds within a second on a computer with like 16 cores. But if you did emulation, you would have to do them one by one. And that's gonna take like really long time because you don't want performance like impact. So you would basically run like maybe one-on-one -on -one core or something like that, but it still limits your ability to parallelize and uh, uh, speed things up. Yeah. Uh, let's start the speaker. So our next speaker is Puriya Namya. 
He's a PhD student at University of Southern California. He's advised by Ramesh Govindan. Hello everyone, I'm Guria. Today I want to talk to you about Hello everyone, uh, today I want to talk to you about heuristics and how you can evaluate them. This is work currently done with my amazing mentors and collaborators from Microsoft and Microsoft Research. In our domain, uh, we want to build practical solutions, and there are some requirements that we need to meet. Two of them are scale and speed. So in order to achieve these two properties, a common way is to use heuristics. As a running example for today's talk, I'm going to use land traffic engineering, but everything applies to other domains as well. In land traffic engineering, B4 and SWAN are two examples of production systems. If you are not familiar with them, their goal is to route some demands in a given topology. Uh, so these production systems use heuristics, and these heuristics are, of course, very well tested and work for the common workflow. We started working with one of these production heuristics called demand pinning. So uh, demand pinning has a very simple idea. It tries to achieve a scalability by reducing the size of the optimization. The way it works is that it first routes the small demands completely through the shortest path, and then for the rest of the demands, it tries to find optimal routing. Uh, so the, the details doesn't matter here, but the high level point is that uh, demand pinning is a production heuristic and it works well in production. So we tried demand pinning on the V4 topology and uh, on many different workflows, and it turns out that it works amazing for most of the workflows. But we find a surprising result. We find that at least for one workload, it can be as large as 23% less efficient than the optimal routing. So in this case, both demand pinning and optimal are able to use all the available capacity in the network. But while optimal is able to satisfy all the demands, demand pinning needs to drop 23% of the traffic. So in this case, uh, this is one of the downsides of using a product, of using a heuristic. In general, heuristics help us achieve scale and speed, but at the cost of uh, performance degradation in some scenarios. So this becomes especially important in large network and systems where the input might deviate from the common state due to some unexpected events. The so users of these heuristics or operators want to know uh, when their heuristics fail, what are their adversarial patterns, and they want to understand the consequences of using a heuristic potentially before integrating them into the production system. So to answer these questions, we need a method, a method that can generate these adversarial inputs. We call an input adversarial if it uh, causes trouble for the heuristic, potentially making it less efficient than the optimal. So formally it tries to maximize the gap or the difference between up and heuristic. And such a method needs to take some inputs, for example, the optimal form of the problem, the heuristic that tries to approximate up and also potentially a third set of constraints that describes the environment and make sure we only look at realistic cases. So we want to build uh, this adversarial generator. And with that in mind, we started uh, looking at the literature for existing methods. And we find that many of them have some inherent limitations that prevent them from finding useful adversarial elements. So in this talk, I'm going to cover black box search methods but everything applies to, uh, but uh, sorry, but we discuss other limitation of other techniques in the paper. So I'm going to use the same scenario as a couple of slides ago. It's on the V4 topology, and the heuristic is demand pinning. On the bottom, I'm showing you the gap each method finds over time. Uh, and the dashed line is the 23% gap. Ideally, we want to find this gap as early as possible. So the ideal point is on top left. We started with the simplest method, which is random testing. We generated a bunch of random inputs and tried to find their gap one by one. And it turns out that the random testing can only find a gap of at most two or three percent, even after running it for a couple of hours. We said that, okay, maybe it's because it's, it's too simple. So let's try something more sophisticated. We tried a uh, field climber and simulated annealing. And these methods actually help for some cases, 
But if the heuristic gets a little bit complex, such as what we have here, they repeatedly get stuck in local optima. So the maximum gap they found is still two or three percent. Now, if the operator only relies on this result, they might think that the heuristic is working well, so let's uh, integrate it. But we already know that the gap of 23% exists. So this method uh, fails to find useful adversarial inputs because uh, they ignore the details of heuristics. And also they ignore the characteristics of the environment. And as a result of this, if the adversarial input for the heuristic is very small, and if the heuristic is working well for most of the cases, they have a hard time finding these useful adversarial inputs. To address this limitation, we developed a new method called Meta. Meta is a white box method with complete visibility into details of the heuristic. It finds inputs that are provably worst case and that are specific to the environment. In this case, Meta was able to find a gap of 23%. Now the operator has a complete view of uh, the heuristic, and they might think that, uh, okay, the heuristic, uh, this 23% the gap is unreasonable for them, and they want to deploy some methods to improve reliability of the heuristic. And Meta uh, can actually help with that. Meta, other than evaluating heuristics, uh, can be used in a couple of ways to improve resiliency of the heuristics too. One example is uh, when we, uh, we can use Meta up to find a set of adversarial inputs. And if this set is small, we can simply run up on these corner cases and catch their solution. And finally, based on uh, the input, we can decide whether we can use a stored solution if it's just a something we have stored, or we can use the heuristics. Another example is uh, when we have different heuristics developed for the same problem, each of them having their own adversarial pattern. We can use meta to find these adversarial patterns, and based on what we observe on the input, we can choose the appropriate heuristics. So these are just two potential examples of how we can use meta to improve reliability of the heuristics. In the next part of the talk, I want to provide a little bit of details on how meta works. Meta relies on two stage games. In two stage games, we have two agents sequentially playing the game. Each of them try to win the game by maximizing their own payoff. The agent wants, wants, to want, wants to find adversarial input, and agent two wants to provide a high quality solution given the inputs. Use this intuition in meta. Here we have an adversarial generator that tries to generate inputs that maximize the gap or the difference between opt and heuristic. Meanwhile, we have two agents of time heuristic that each of them try to maximize their own objective given their own constraints and given the inputs from adversarial generator. So the way this works is that adversarial generator comes up with these inputs and passes them to opt and heuristic. Then uh, each of these agents compute their solution and return their objective. And finally, adversarial generator takes out the feedback, the difference, plus some other signal and tries to further improve the gap. The way that we formulate this intuition is through two-level optimization. Here, the outer level tries to mimic the behavior of adversarial generator, while the two inner optimizations tries to try to uh, define the determine the behavior of up and This is a very straightforward formulation, but it turns out that existing solvers such as Huobi cannot support multi-level optimization. So we have to translate this two-level optimization into a single level one. And we do that using KKT encoding, which is a standard optimization technique. Uh, I'm not going to details because of time constraints, but you can read more about this later. So after I, uh, I described how meta works and why is it better than existing methods, the next part is where we can apply meta. Meta can be applied to heuristics that can be reformulated either as an optimization problem, either as a feasibility problem, or a complex optimization problem. We believe that many existing heuristics using a standard optimization techniques can be translated in either of these two ways. And to show generality, we apply to uh, random heuristics, specifically pop, and conditional heuristics, specifically demanding. So to conclude, I talked about limitations of existing more, existing works and how meta addresses those limitations. I also talked about meta finding inputs that are uh, probably worst case and specific to the environment. Also in the paper, we discuss how meta improved our understanding of the heuristics and their failure happened. So right now we are actively working on meta and we are trying to improve the scalability of meta and extending meta to other heuristics potentially beyond traffic engineering. Thanks for this and comment. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is uh, Wei Tao from RISE. 
Um, very, very nice work. I really like it. So um, I'm, I have some concern about the second point. How, how did you guarantee you can find the worst case input with your uh, Sure. This is a good question. Uh, sorry, I missed that. It's actually related to the other optimization. As you can see, the first level of optimization tries to maximize the gap for the difference. So when the solver terminates, it's actually uh, guarantees that the difference between up and pure state is maximized. And so it's probably is a worse case. Can, can I just make an analog? Like your like we don't listen, listen to the optimal point. You may point to some optimal points. So I think uh, the way that uh, so the, the way that solvers, uh, for example, work is that uh, finally, uh, for example, when Urobi terminates, is that you, you you ensure that this is the optimal solution. So when it's an optimal solution in this case is that uh, basically the objective is maximized, and then the objective is maximized is, uh, is that the optimal and pure state is has a, has a maximum difference. I'm not sure if I understand it. But I see. Uh, I can make a very, very simple example. So, in my experience, I have found a very interesting case, which is a, my algorithm has a truncated to integers. So, that algorithm only has one input that will cause problems because of this truncate. Other inputs will not lead to the problem. Only one input. You add it by 0.1, there will be no problem. So, so I think. Uh, in this case, even if it's only single input that uh, causes the gap, and let's say the heuristic is working well for uh, other cases, I think the way it works is that uh, the optimization or the solver, for example, will be uh, tries to, uh, for example, search over the space until it finds that example. And when it finds an example, basically, for example, in convex optimization, you have uh, primal and dual. And uh, if it's a convex problem, when pro primal and dual are equal to each other, just guarantee that uh, this is the optimal solution and impermanence. For example, in a mixed integer problem, for example, if you have an integer case, it's a, it, it usually solves it using a branch and bound algorithm. And basically, it moves on, moves on until you, you probably find this optimal solution. I see. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, in the interest of time, we'll take just one more question. Okay, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. I have a question about uh, Alexander from ETH again. I have a question about your terms. Um, how feasible is it to always find an optimal solution? Are there some traffic engineering problems where you are not confident that you actually know what the optimal solution is, so you might not be able to really find the gap? Or is it always possible to find the optimal solution with confidence? Well, I think uh, sometimes it might take some time. So for example, you need to wait a couple of hours or something, but uh, when uh, the solver terminates, uh, it always uh, probably find the worst case gap. But in some cases, it might be, for example, undesirable. And we actually uh, explored it in the paper too. Sometimes you might you might want to early do an early terminate. So let's say you find the gap of 20 percent or 15 percent, and you are uh, already you know that okay, the your state is not working for you. You can also terminate uh, the solver early on too. Let's time this speaker again. We have a short panel discussion. We have Behenas uh, for minding the gap, and we have Venkat for automating nipple curious like design and analysis. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, from CMU. Uh, I guess this is related to some of one of the questions that Brighton asked, and maybe another question that came at the end of their talk as well. So, often, in, like, I think. I see a lot of these as like sort of like bug finding and model checking type works, right? And one thing that happens in the software engineering world is they have this something called, I believe, the small world hypothesis. That oftentimes when there is a bug, there exists like a small minimal example that reproduces the bug. 
So you don't actually have to find like long sequences. You can actually reproduce the bug with a much smaller uh, input sequences and fuzzing you might. Uh, so I, I guess the question is then that actually helps with explainability or helps the program or fix the bug and so on. So I was curious in, in your things, do, do those sort of small world phenomena uh, exist? Or is it the case that condition control is so bad that you have to wait for 100,000 uh, events before something manifests? So I guess I can uh, answer for the formal methods method and let the answer the fuzzing method. So the formal methods method, certainly one of the ways I make the example more understandable is to just make the example shorter and then find the shortest example that has the bug. Okay. So uh, in my fuzzing case, uh, with the traffic injection, right, in the scoring function, we actually use uh, a score to minimize the injected traffic. And so we actually try to generate the minimal traffic injection vector that triggers a bug. Otherwise, like you could have like the adversarial cross traffic just send like at full line rate and just completely like subdue the link, right? Uh, and so we actually have that as part of the scoring function. And so you can do such things. Um, so even for the link trace, if you wanted to impose some implicit constraints, which are hard to model directly, you could just have that as part of the scoring function. It's like in one part, you're trying to come up with a heuristic to generate it. In the other part, you're just calculating a score as part of the heuristic, which may be easier to do. And so you could have things like that, and uh, that would help uh, in generating more explainable results. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a very exciting session. I wanted to ask in particular about the first two talks. It, it seems like you're, to me, you're coming at this from different points of view about what part of the problem you think is tractable. The first paper is about a model where the network essentially has arbitrary behavior or maybe even almost adversarial behavior, and you're trying to prove statements in the worst case. And I think the question for this research agenda is, will you be able to eventually tackle realistic congestion control schemes? Uh, you know, will it be able to grow to a scheme that is kind of one that we'd actually want to use and one that has good average case performance? This kind of thing? I think that is the uncertainty there. And the second approach is about taking realistic congestion control schemes and trying to fuzz them with a sort of much more constrained uh, network that's a sort of um, you know, perturbed, like you have a certain throughput and then you sort of perturb a little bit. And I think the risk there would be, you know, the congestion control schemes I think you have unlocked, but it's the network adversary. Will you be able to invent a, a realistic adversary that actually captures all the bad things that could happen in your in, in real life? And I think you know, Ben Cobb might say, no, you have to really prove it or else there's probably something bad that could happen that you won't capture. So I guess the question is, can the two of you maybe comment on what you think of the pros and cons of each other's kind of model of what's locked down and what's adversarial? And I, I want to ask, what do you think about a world where the thing that's adversarial is not what you're picking, but rather the load? What if the adversarial model is the application, which can either turn on and off these flows sort of arbitrarily, and we want to guarantee some behavior under that kind of model? Is that a, a good one to reason about? So the load, so I'll answer the last part of your question first. The load, absolutely, that is something we want to reason about. And at least with our approach, we can. Um, and I think you pretty much summarized the advantages and disadvantages perfectly, right? Uh, and I don't have much more to add about what you said. This is in the formal methods, uh, it's really the, 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 we have a guarantee that whatever we find is accurate. But with the fuzzing thing, what you get is you get to test real implementations. Whereas we have abstract models of uh, implementations. And as for whether we get to an algorithm that does have real, is realistic, uh, Facebook is actually using an algorithm that, so the rock thing Anup talked about, Facebook is using something that we believe is equivalent to that right now. So, uh, one thought that I would like to add uh, is uh, so even the first approach, right, requires a network model. Like if you technically allow an arbitrary network model, it's uh, going to like trigger really weird things that may not ever be useful, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, so that part is kind of common. And uh, with the fuzzing approach, one thing that, we, and with this as well, what you could do is you could um, model acceptable traces using consensus uh, based on like the past 30 years of knowledge in CCAs. Like you take every CCA that's been developed you run your trace on all of them and see if there's at least someone that works, right? Um, and if there's like, you know, like if 20% of the CCAs work on that trace, maybe it's interesting. And if none of them work, it's not interesting. 
So um, you could develop a model that way where you don't have to explicitly specify something, uh, but yeah. And with the fuzzing approach, maybe if you ran it for a really, really long time, um, you would trigger uh, things, but yeah, it, there's no guarantees. Whereas their approach provides guarantees. I think that's the fundamental difference. Um, one is easier to do and more broadly applicable, but there are no guarantees. The other is a little bit more theoretical, um, but you can provide certain guarantees, yeah. Thank you. Also another thing, like in the formal thing, we're also experimenting if we can control the adversarialness of the verifier. So basically we can ask like the CGS loop that, okay, we want a condition algorithm that has these properties for adversarial networks and some other nicer, better properties for more average case or ideal links. So we can add multiple objectives for different types of networks and ask the loop to uh, like, in a combination, like synthesize something that works for all those cases. So that we, we don't only have something that works good, has good performance in the worst case, but also close to ideal performance in like average case. Ah, yeah, great, great session. Um, so I guess this, this question started with the mind the gap paper. Um, it seems like if you're taking an optimization approach or a verification, so it, it, at least verifying within a model, um, if I understand correctly, you have to represent the engineering heuristic inside the optimizer. So it, it has to have some degree of simplicity of what that heuristic is. So a uh, question for, for that work, but, but also all of them, how complex can that get? How, um, you know, how deep of a uh, traffic engineering or congestion control heuristic can you represent in optimization form to the point that you can hope that you could actually prove something about optimality? Right. So I disagree with part of that statement, which is the heuristic need not become uh, simple. But it needs to be representable in convex form. And then the question becomes how clever are you to find that convex form? Obviously. Uh, that part of it is depends on the heuristic. A lot of the heuristics we find are actually representable in that way, but with a certain amount of work. For example, with the demand pitting heuristic that Puja showed, it took, I think, Ryan and I like two weeks, three weeks to actually figure out how to represent it in convex form. So even though it seems simple, Representing it in complex convex form is not as simple because there's a um, if constraint. If constraints by nature are not convex. So you need to play convex optimization tricks to convert them into convex constraints. Um, so it can be a little bit of work um, and it requires experts in optimization, obviously, to do it, but I think it's doable. The other thing we're investigating is um, if you, instead of using KKT constraints, convert to using primal dual gap, you can also extend this to non-convex heuristics somewhat, but you still need to represent them in mathematical form, which I think is the same problem that the verification piece of work also um, requires. So there is one uh, idea that we've been investigating but haven't really published on anything, where you don't need to model the heuristic in the solver, which is, suppose there are two conflicting objectives and you believe you have a combined objective that kind of, uh, borders between those two conflicting objectives. You can ask the solver to tell, is there ever a case where this combined objective does really well, but one of the other objectives that it's supposed to combine does really poorly? So that's a case where you don't have to mo model the heuristic itself into the solver. You're, you're asking questions about the objectives, not the solver. That's one. Thanks. <laughs> But I wanted to push a bit more on Keith's question because I think you guys took the easy way out and said, yeah, there's trade-offs, you know, like there's trade-offs for anything. <laughs> and I think, you know, in software engineering, there are people who will like gung-ho go and say, you know, everything needs to be proved correct or like proofs of program correctness are useless. You should focus on resiliency and redundancy. And I'm wondering, and then there's, you know, the boring middle ground of their trade-offs, right? So I'm wondering if any of you are willing to kind of go on record and say, you know, for the vast majority of networks, we do or we don't need these sort of worst case proofs. Like, and this is coming from somebody who really doesn't have much practical experience with networks to tell the truth. So I'm curious your experience, if the question makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, so, in general, like uh, if you choose one or the other, you are making trade-offs, right? Um, 
So this is not about like choosing to make a trade-off. If you choose one or the other, you are making a trade-off by definition of these techniques. Um, and there might be a benefit in kind of doing both, right? So you could design like, um, uh, you, you could get insights into design using something what they propose, right? So a more abstract model, uh, and it gives you some idea of like what type of congestion window updates might work and so on, right? Um, and then when you actually implement it, there will be uh, differences. Um, and it's not going to be true to that because uh, uh, like in the real world, there are some factors that are not modeled uh, uh, in a more abstract way. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think there's kind of a dual ground where you do both and uh, not, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's my thought. Another thought is, I guess, so, okay, in our system, we're trying to automatically build proofs as well, but I think a lot of the learnings of how we construct proofs and how we represent proofs can inform how we write proofs for heuristics, which cannot necessarily be easily incorporated into these mathematical models. So, Okay, we have a complicated heuristic, but now we have built a framework for proving properties about them. So can we, can a human use that framework to prove, prove properties about like other heuristics, which like a computer cannot? So there may be ideas which like cross here and there, the boundary and each of these domains can guide each other. Prevented us from taking one easy way out. So I'm gonna take another, <laughs> which is, I think like the trend has been that in the next few years, the scalability of these proving systems is going to increase because of the dreaded word neural networks. So like the output is still going to be a rigorous proof that you can verify with cock or whatever, but our ability to search through the search space is going to be vaster. So maybe that trade-off doesn't exist. Okay. Wait for quantum computing and then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, last question. Last? Okay. Uh, uh, hey, Hari So first of all, I have to say, I'm just loving this um, focus on congestion control. And traffic. <laughs> <laughs> good, good problems, because I think far too often we're, people working on these topics are quite apologetic about it, and you should wear it with, with pride. Um, so um, I think we just want to lay, lay the you know, sort of the landscape a little bit. When this sort of work started many years ago, people would run it through simulation, and then they, they said, all right, my networks have some sort of probabilistic or stochastic behavior, maybe they'll lose packets at some packet loss rate and so forth. And then about 10 years ago, um, actually Keith, Anirudh, and others had this idea that we're going to generate traces by running, by saturating the network. And we'll run something, and then mahi-mahi and tools like that, and emulator tools have that. Um, what's really interesting about this, these talks here are, I sort of saw, three types of ideas. One of them was uh, um, do this, uh, construct these traces that create some behavior. In the, in, in the proof work, you have this sort of non-random, non-deterministic type of view of the world. Actually, in a way, models are non-congestive aspects or, and, and so on and so forth. And then yours, you're sort of learning something about it. And I think this is very fascinating and it's hard to know what the right future is gonna be. However, one of the things that I think many of you may be assuming is that the lower layers, the network itself isn't adapting or reacting to what's being imposed from above. If you sort of take a, you know, a wireless network, for example, like a LTE or 5G, it, it's, it's, you can't gather traces run on one protocol and sort of even with the saturator type work where you gather these traces, uh, who knows, maybe the network behaved differently because it was being pumped with a ton of data. And so I would make the case for two things. One is some degree of causality assumption, um, a causality model for what would happen with a different protocol if I ran it on a network where I gathered some traces on one other protocol. And I, I think I, I, the question for all of you is whether these works, the works that you're doing apply to cases where each is adapting to the other, where the network is adapting to the load that's being presented on it and the, the endpoints or the protocols are adapting to whatever the network is seeing or whether there's some fundamental barrier in each of your techniques for that. So I think I'm the lucky one here because a little bit in our setting, uh, basically the traffic engineering setting is well suited for the case because we have control pretty much, we know the demand and then the controller is centralized. So I'm a little bit lucky that I have an easy way out. But um, I think um, what I would say- I'm not sure you do. What if there's some optical thing in it? It's changing it, and you don't really know. You have to uncover it, even though it might be one option. So that's exact. That 
part of the reason, again, I'm lucky because in the game model that we have, we have games with hidden information and you can model this as a game with hidden information in a way, right? Where I know that I have rational agents and I know that I have information that I don't know about, but I have some probability of it occurring. And there we won't have rigorous proof, we would have probabilistic proofs, but the model extends to those types of approaches as well. I wouldn't know about the scalability of it because we haven't tried it, but there are techniques from game theory that extend our approach to that. So I think, again, I think it's just luck. It's not necessarily that we thought about it that way, but yeah. yeah that's actually a good question. So actually, we do have to think about causality. So what happens is in our loop, like when we get a counter example, a new candidate CCA may not actually cause that trace to happen. And so we have to explicitly say, if this counter example can be feasibly produced by the CCA, then we should enforce the objectives. Otherwise we'll need a new trace for the CCA. And so it's very explicit that if causally it's feasible, then we enforce the objectives. Otherwise, we get a new counter example from the verifier for this new candidate. So in that sense, like we actually explicitly had to think about causality here. So um, in CCFAS, we have a single algorithm, right? For which we are generating a trace. And so um, in the end, what matters is how the packets are transmitted through the bottleneck, right? Um, so it's like, we are kind of combining the reaction and everything all together as like this one run. Uh, so, uh, okay, how do I put this? So we generate a trace, we run the CCA and the CCA fails on that trace, right? So there, we are not even like thinking about causality because it's not relevant for this particular task. Um, but where it would be relevant is when you are trying to do like the consensus approach I talked about, right? Where a bunch of traces like, if they uh, fail on other CCAs, will it fail on this CCA as well? So for that, we need to kind of model causality and that'll have an effect there. Right? Yeah, but, so, but, but the thing is that you're assuming that that CCA on this network will actually induce such a trace. It's possible that the network adapts in a way that doesn't ever induce the trace that you think you're observing. Yeah, so our network model is just modeling like link transmission rates, yeah. right? So if you find a trace that triggers a buggy behavior, it's possible that it's never actually going to happen in real life, but it does give us an insight into why the CCA failed and we can go in and fix that, right? So it's possible that the scenario we generated may not like be likely at all in the real world, but it does give us some insight into why it's failing. Um, so yeah, in that sense, yeah. Thanks. Uh, let's thank all the panelists.